Good morning. Um, and I am going to present on an insect that actually is of economic importance, so helping uh, fulfill the second part of the very lengthy uh, title of uh, our uh, triennial uh, events here. Uh, let me go on. Oh, I should make another pitch, by the way. Look at the bottom there. You see the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, I work out of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And you are all invited to uh, come visit, to come visit the collection, to just come hang out, look at interesting uh, immigrant insects. And uh, we'd love to have you in New York. Uh, the work I'll be talking about was published uh, last fall in uh, PLOS One. Um, and uh, you can see the title there. It's a question mark in part because uh, the journal has a policy that you can't assert things. So we circumvented that. To, that is to say, how do we really know it's the most prolific as little bug? Well, you know, how do you really know anything? Uh, so we have the phrase that is a question mark. These are my uh, colleagues, and I could not have, uh, we could not have done this. Uh, um, study you're about to see in its full form without working together. Uh, Alan Stewart is a professor at the University of Sussex, and at the time this study was done, Claire Harkin was uh, his uh, graduate student. So I want to give them credit. And this literally uh, was not something I could have done on my own. You notice I have sections here for introductions and things. After I put together my whole presentation, I went back and read the rules and said, OK, you have to have these. There it is. Here's the bug in question. This is Philanus pomerius. Um, you can uh, see that uh, uh, it's a good spittle bug. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with spittle bugs, the nymphs suck xylem sap. Uh, when they excrete it, they put in a mucopolysaccharide. They then incorporate uh, bubbles, and they make a, a foam in which they live. It's thought to be protective against uh, parasitoids and also to keep them from uh, desiccating. And uh, there you see down here, see if I can make this move, there's an adult. And uh, there is a, a, a spittle mass in nature. That's what the thing looks like when it's not exposed. And the host plant there is uh, Lotus corniculatus. Um, for me, the high point of this conference was when uh, one of the dignitaries came in and said, wait a minute, what about this Okanarinka without borders? And I think what we really meant was a Kenarinka studies without borders or a Kenarinka without borders. Uh, there's a big problem with uh, introductions. And uh, Landis Primarius is probably the, the world champion uh, of Kenarinka traveler. Uh, here you can see the distribution. Um, uh, here in uh, the Eurasia, uh, it's thought to be. Uh, Definitely the native place of distribution probably originated for reasons we'll see a bit later around the Mediterranean. Uh, the, it, it supposedly is distributed all the way to China and Japan. I have not found good records of seeing specimens from either place. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm counting on Yao Lin when he retires to take up this question and really uh, get the distribution done. I do know. I don't know if I'm going to quite the right place, but up here somewhere is Kyrgyzstan, where Chris went and collected, and there were lots and lots of Atlantis primaries in Kyrgyzstan. So it's abundant that far east. It has also been introduced into uh, where I live, in northeastern uh, United States. It's the most common spittle bug in the northeastern United States. There's a disjunct distribution out on the west coast here, uh, California uh, north. And uh, those introductions are probably a long time ago in the eastern United States, at least probably in the 1800s. However, more recently, uh, it has been introduced into Hawaii, probably in the 1930s. It's been introduced into Iceland. This was very recent, uh, probably in the 1990s. There's a little population around Reykjavik. I don't know if it's underneath the volcano. Maybe it's not there anymore. There's a population down here in the Azores, which is probably an older introduction. Uh, but not certainly introduced. And then there's a big population in both North and South Island of New Zealand uh, where it's been introduced. And finally, uh, because of Reunion, uh, the island came up in an earlier presentation uh, by Maxime on the caves, uh, there was a, a record of introduction in Reunion on strawberries, but it seems to have 
disappeared, so I put down there a little sign indicating that that's an introduction that appears to have been extirpated after it occurred. But the point is, these things get around a lot. Um, people have been looking at Linus Pomerius host for a long time. The earliest big study was by uh, an amateur German, uh, Hugo Schmidt, did a, uh, published two big papers between the first paper and the second. World War I broke out. Uh, when it was introduced into Hawaii, this was a big deal in Hawaii, so it was a big study in Hawaii in the 1940s, came up with a lot of host plants. You can already start to get the point. These are, these are lots of host plants. We're used, we're used to looking at monophages or oligophages. Uh, and then, uh, this is historically a very important uh, study in Long and Severn in California because it was associated uh, with the first studies of vectors of Xylella fastidiosa, which will loom large in our conversation as we uh, come back, uh, which was uh, in California the cause of Pierce's disease of grapevines. Uh, the first really big study of Linus Pomerius anywhere was a monograph by Weaver and King in 1954, so we're at the 70th anniversary of that this year, and uh, they listed 383 hosts. Uh, probably a record at that time for any any uh, insect. Um, there's some mistakes in that. When I went back and looked at it closely. There's some interesting errors, but overall uh, they were correct. And uh, Weaver uh, lived to be uh, almost 100 years old. And I realized we got on a Kenarika meeting on Congress in uh, Worcester, where he worked in 1990. And one of the regrets of my life is that I did not look him up when I was there. Um, my advice for young people, by the way, is when you go to congresses, take advantage to meet the people who are a little more senior than yourself, because the opportunity may not come again. Uh, here are other contributions after Weaver and King. Oli Halka and his collaborators in Finland did some big studies. We'll come back to him. A uh, Frenchman named Ernest Nuri did a, did a major study on his own and, and compiling obscure European records. I owe, I owe my access to that to Adeline. No, you're, no American library could find it, but Adeline found it somewhere. And uh, Jennifer and Dennis Owen uh, then did a big study of their English suburban garden. I'll come back to that in the next slide. Big PhD thesis by Booth who looked a lot at New Zealand. We've got a lot of host records there. And there's been a recent gigantic outpouring of records in uh, uh, the Mediterranean area due to the Zylala studies for reasons uh, we'll come back to. Just the last 10 years have been an enormous increase in the knowledge of host plants in the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, this is Ole Hauka. I mentioned this group before. They, they, their work is of interest in part because they work uh, in natural environments and uh, they got a 165 host in Finland. And I mention this in particular because the second paper I published in 1973, when that old, uh, was with Oli I The only time I ever met Oli Halka in person was at one of these meetings at the Cardiff Congress in, uh, in Britain. Uh, so that was a, another reason, you know, to take advantage of people when you've got a chance to meet them. Uh, this is a, a wonderful contribution. I wanted to make sure we recognized a, 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 a female contribution to this list. This is Jennifer Owen. Uh, she, was, she was a PhD. She wasn't a professional biologist. Her husband, Dennis Owen, uh, was. When she came back from Uganda, she observed that they had more species of butterflies in her English garden than she had in her uh, Uganda garden. And she thought, hmm, I better start looking at species diversity here. So she and her husband, Catalog every species of insect they could find over a period of 30 years in their English uh, suburban garden. And for uh, Atlantis Pomerius, they observed 143 hosts in this, this one English garden. Really quite an extraordinary amateur contribution. Uh, I should go back, by the way, and say, um, although she published a book on these observations, she didn't publish the numbers and the details on Atlantis Pomerius, but my colleagues in England were able to find in the county archives, her notebooks, which she had deposited, they were just like day books in which she'd written down all the species she observed. So we were able to recover uh, her uh, observations from there. She's still alive, but she has multiple sclerosis and is, and is not well. Uh, so why the heck is it worth, you know, obviously this thing feeds on a lot of things. Why is it worth going out of our way to try to find it? how many things, what is the real diversity of host plants? And the, the short answer to that is Xylella fastidiosa. And I hope all of you have heard of it. If you haven't, you're about to. 
So Xylella fastidiosa is a, uh, a plant pathogen uh, bacterium. It's uh, native uh, to the New World. It is, uh, it grows in xylem vessels to the plant and all of the vectors are xylem feeding insects. All of the xylem feeding uh, insects are, are Catamaranca and the two important groups are Spittlebugs, Cercopoidae, my group, and sharpshooter leafhoppers, uh, Cicadellinae. Uh, cicadas are also xylem feeding, but because they live underground, they don't move between plants, they're, they're not. Uh, effective uh, or, or important uh, vectors. Uh, you can see here, here are the bacteria, they look like bacteria, but here's a poor little xylem vessel just clogged full of these things. And what happens is they proliferate the xylem vessels and they clog them up and the plant starts to uh, die of thirst. Not a good thing for the plant. Um, Xylella was first studied in detail in California where it causes Pierce's disease of grapes. It was discovered in Southern California in Anaheim where it uh, Disneyland is now in California. Um, it, um, this is Northern California. In the foreground here, you can see grapes that have been uh, killed by Pierce's disease. Doesn't wipe out whole areas. And uh, the uh, vectors in Northern California are mostly, there's another story to that with a spittlebug, but mostly sharpshooters. Uh, here's what got people really, really excited in California at the beginning. And what happened here was Pierce's disease and Xylella fastidiosa had been in California, but all of a sudden there was an introduction of a new vector. And that vector was uh, the vector you can see down here in the corner. Uh, that's the glassy wing sharpshooter. It's a great, great, great big thing. And it's native to the southeastern U.S. It got introduced across continent into California, an extremely effective vector of uh, Xylella fastidiosa and almost, as you can see, wiped out the grape industry in Southern California, which is extremely important uh, economically. Uh, it was brought under control uh, partly because they found that the, it has an alternative host in citrus trees and you can control it in citrus trees, but there's still a tremendous amount of uh, effort that goes into containing uh, glassy wing sharpshooters. It's not something that's gone away. Uh, spend a lot of money on that in California. Uh, it's also in the tropics. Again, you remember this is a new world thing. The, uh, the strain in California was introduced from Central America uh, to North America. Here we have a native strain in uh, Brazil that causes a disease of oranges, orange citrus, orange is very important in Brazil. Uh, also transmitted by sharpshooters. They've got it under uh, control uh, uh, by screening, making sure that the young plants don't get it. So it's, it's not ravaging things in Brazil. But here in the next slide is the reason that people are very, very, very concerned about Xylella fastidiosa now. And that is uh, sometime in the 21st century, probably, it, uh, a strain of Xylella fastidiosa came into Italy Molecular evidence suggests it was brought on coffee plants from Costa Rica. It's pretty, pretty definite molecular evidence. And that strain interacted very badly with olive trees in the boot hill of Italy and started to kill them off, and it started to kill them off in great numbers. And to uh, show you here that this is not just a little local phenomenon in one field, here are thousands of hectares of olives in the boot hill of Italy. Uh, these haven't lost their leaves for the fall. Olives are evergreens. These are trees that have been killed by a slight level of fastidiosa. It kills them pretty fast in, in two or three years uh, after they get infected. And uh, of course, this is uh, my presentation. Why are we talking about this? Because in Italy and in Europe in general, the only economically consequential vector of Xylella fastidiosa is Phalanus primarius, the, the bug we're talking about uh, here today in terms of its uh, polyphagy. Um, so this has led to a gigantic resurgence of interest. I mean, here you're talking to a fellow who started looking at these things uh, when I was a graduate student. They were mostly of abstract interest then. And all of a sudden, in my old age, this has come back as an extremely important economic insect and uh, people are interested in a deep sort of way in what I study. It's really a great way to uh, go into my working retirement uh, methods. So I and my colleagues have built a comprehensive compilation of, of uh, Phalanus primarius hosts. 
One thing I advise you to do when you're talking to journal editors and you're doing this sort of thing is not to call it a list, so we have to think of a fancier thing to call it, so we call it a comprehensive compilation. Um, we have two primary sources uh, for this uh, list. One is a, a database that I maintain uh, for all host, known host of world cercopoidia. Um, it has presently about 9,000 records, about 2,500 of those of Galenus primarius. And Galenus primarius is so abundant, has so many records, it can't possibly have them all, not even uh, all the records we collected for this study. So the second primary source for, for uh, this study was the Bridget Project. This was a uh, British citizen science project funded in part by the uh, EU, when Britain was part of the EU, ran from 2019 to 2021. And people were asked to send in pictures of spittles from around Britain to do a survey to find out where and on what Blanus Primarius was living uh, in Britain. Thousands and thousands of people did this. And people looked at the photographs to check the spittle. Claire Harkin, uh, one of my co-authors, did, did a lot of that, that uh, work. Um, we only looked at nymphs. We didn't want to get into the issue of bugs that just happened to be sitting on things. And uh, this was all driven by a concern that xylella might be introduced in Britain. Xylella is not known to be in Britain now. So, and this, here's a cute little, cute little pamphlet from the, uh, the, the, the Bridget Project produced to encourage amateurs to look for spittle bugs in their gardens. And for people with a little, little more highfalutin interest, here's a more sophisticated pamphlet that got put out. And this actually tells you how to distinguish the nymphs of Lanus primarius from the couple of spe other species that might be possibly confused for it in Britain. Britain is a wonderful place to do this study. You could not do it in the United States. Our spittlebug fauna is too diverse. But in Britain, it's narrow enough and specific enough that you can uh, do a good study, an effective study of this kind. And here is our criteria for inclusion in the, in the uh, host plant records. Uh, we excluded lab records, uh, particularly because of Xylella. There are a lot of people raising Phalaenus in the lab, and Phalaenus will live, as you'll see, on almost anything. Uh, we only wanted to uh, include things where Phalaenus was living on them in nature. Uh, secondly, we excluded adult host records uh, that were based on single individuals. These are mostly museum specimens. On the grounds, we all know that one problem in kind of rinkle work is when a bug is just sitting somewhere, do you know if it's feeding? Do you know if it's not feeding? Well, a little hard to tell. With nymphs, not a problem because a uh, spittle bug can't feed without producing spittle. So if you see spittle, you know they're feeding. That's one of the great things about spittle bugs and the reason you can do good lists. But so to reduce some of the noise from sitting specimens, we excluded those based on just single <coughs> individual records. Uh, we excluded questionable ex species identifications, both of, of plants and the uh, the spittle bug, and, and for the Bridget project, the citizen science project, we included only this. Now we get to the results, and I, I'm not very good technically. I was trying to figure out how to, how to do an audio. Da, 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 da. Here are the results, but I couldn't. <laughs> so uh, here you have only the World Cup here of, uh, of uh, insect polyphagy with a a Philanus primarius uh, then drinking, drinking from the cup of victory. Uh, we found documented 1,311 host plants for this bug. That is an enormous number of host plants. Uh, it is definitely, definitely has more host plant records than any other, any other insect, uh, and, and it's more than more than more than double. You'll see the competitors in a minute. And the most astonishing thing to me was that Bridget, Bridget Citizen Science Survey picked up almost half of that total, just in Britain, in people's gardens. And they picked up 358 host plant records that were new to science. I, I think that's an extraordinary thing in terms of the potential power of citizen science. And this was not my part of the project. You hear that from somebody. Uh, just to go back, uh, be careful of what you write when you write things down. Uh, well, Ossian Nielsen said in, in, in his big bunch of tomes on Scandinavian, fellow uh, Scandinavian, in 1981, that Planus primarius had over a thousand hosts. There was no way he possibly could have known that. That was a, a guess based on Weaver and King's work plus uh, Halko's group's work. But it turned out he was right. 
So there you go. Sometimes you speculate and it comes out okay. Uh, it's taken about uh, 40 years to uh, validate his speculation. Um, in deciding uh, where and what to publish, uh, and I, um, again, when you go to, this is a tricky thing to go to editors with a paper like this. If you want to publish a list of a thousand, something, well, we have a First of all, it had to be online because we knew nobody was going to print this list unless we had a government agency do it. We didn't have a government agency. I think the uh, European Food Safety Authority probably would have done it had any of us been from an EU country, but I certainly wasn't. And the people in Britain left too early. That's another, that's a political story. So we had to be online, uh, and we wanted it to be electronically searchable so that people could easily search for a host of uh, interest to them and be open access. Because, you know, why do this stuff and, and put a paywall between people and important information like this? And it, again, you had to find an editor who was willing to publish an enormous host list. I fought to keep this thing from being exiled to the supplementary materials because I really wanted it up front where people would see it. But also, when I was doing this work, I found I came across two papers uh, in which the supplementary materials had simply disappeared. They're not as stable as the main journal stuff, and so I was so we got it. We got it, and the the journal was plus one. Uh, you can see up here. Um, Boss One has the great disadvantage of many open access things, which is it has enormous page charges. But fortunately, my colleague Alan Stewart's institution had a contract uh, with the PLOS uh, journals, and we were able to get the cost of the author's charges uh, covered by the University of Sussex. Uh, so this is sort of a, a beginning of what they look like. Uh, this is uh, the head of the first uh, 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 29 pages. <laughs> of a host, and the, here's a two-page sample of what this thing looked like to give you an idea of the magnitude. And here we can see, look a little more closely what the details look like. Uh, so as you can see, we have plant family, so we divided everything up by plant family. We didn't want a list of hosts just by species alphabetical order, that didn't make sense. Then we have the plant species. Uh, then, this is very important, we have the stage, uh, nymphs or adults. Over 90% of our observations include nymphs. So there's no possibility that this highly inflated number is just a, a, an artifact of sitting records. And I think most of our adult records are, and are in fact, uh, good. Um, and then we have geographic areas. We divided the world. We divided Europe up somewhat arbitrarily uh, into about four portions, Eastern and Western North America, since there are disjunct distribution into different portions, and then the various island populations. Uh, and then we have the citizen science data. And we uh, mark this with bullet marks, partly to, to make the impact of the study clear. So where you have three, three dots, it means this was one of the ones new to science. Where you have two dots, it was new, a record new to Britain. And where you have one dot, it was a validation of a pre-existing British uh, record. And it gives you a way to visually get a, get a sense of the impact of that study. And then finally, we had uh, selected references. Uh, so there, there, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of papers on Melanus primarius host. We don't cite them all. There are 248 uh, references, we, but we try to cite at least one paper for each geographic area, and where we had both adults and nymphs, we tried to cite at least one paper with records uh, for each. And here's the competition. So uh, I said, world, world champion insect polyphage, right up at the. Right up at the top here, there's that three, that 1,311. If you look down to poor number two, there's the fall webworm, which I think is a pretty, pretty serious and widespread pest, but it's only got 636 uh, known hosts. And uh, even its records are biased because those records include artificial feeding experiments, which we did, uh, did not include. Uh, and if you sort of glance through the list, you'll see that uh, most of the competition are either scale insects or uh, lepidopterin and it's larvae. Lepidopterin and larvae uh, are, are the things that count. Uh, you also see that some fairly famous things just don't have that many known hosts. Uh, spongy moth, have you changed the common name in Europe? Used to be that uh, ethnically derogatory term called gypsy moth. Uh, at any rate, it, that's more than 300 species, but nobody's enumerated anything approximating uh, some of these other things. And uh, here you see our, our favorite current 
introduced uh, polyphage in North America, the spotted lanternfly, which only has 100, 172 uh, recorded hosts. So, Linus Bryce wins the prize, uh, hands down, uh, in terms of the, the, what I call the horse race. The reviewers made us take out the horse race, by the way, and they thought that was too informal or something, or maybe it's narrowly cultural for Britain and the United States. Uh, oops, I think I pushed the wrong thing. Here it is. So, why the heck is Blanus primarius so polyphagous? This, this is an extraordinary level of polyphagy. Why? Part of it, undoubtedly, and, and I think the two basic part of it has to do with geographic distribution. Uh, the second has to do, I think, with xylem feeding. Here we are back to the same uh, distribution map we've seen before. Undoubtedly, one reason it has so many. Uh, host is because it occurs in so many diverse environments, all the way from Hawaii to south of the Tropic of Capricorn, almost to the Arctic Circle. It gets within about 35, 50 kilometers of the Arctic Circle in northern Finland. That's an extraordinary range of, it, of, uh, of environments. So uh, environmentally, it has a lot of tolerance, and that's one of the reasons. But it's very tricky. Are you, an, are, are you widely distributed, distributed because you have the ability to be a polyphage or are you a polyphage because you're widely distributed? There's a chicken and egg that's very, very tricky to sort out. Uh, so there's some ambiguity there. Uh, the other aspect, and I hope I don't bore you too much with this, but this is one of my, my favorite subjects in biology, is island feeding. It's associated in general with uh, polyphagy. Uh, and xylem sap is a, is a terrible thing to eat. If you were going to choose something to live on for nutriment, it would not be xylem sap. It's two or three orders of magnitude less concentrated than xylem sap. Lacks a lot of essential amino acids. It's under negative pressure, so you have to spend a lot of uh, energy sucking it out of the plant. But on the other hand, it has very few chemical defenses. Xylem sap isn't so terribly different from one plant to another, including plants that are you know, quite different in their phylogenetic background. Uh, as a result, uh, xylem-feeding insects are often uh, polyphagous, polyphages, whatever your pronunciation preference. How do they do it? Well, uh, uh, like one characteristic of xylem feeders is they have these enormous inflated uh, faces uh, in which there are sucking muscles. You can see in the uh, Adults here, uh, there's some little striations across the face. Those are the attachment points for the sucking muscles. And this allows you to pull a lot of xylem sap uh, out of the plant in the face of negative uh, pressure. Um, they also have, and this is really important, and uh, uh, Yasek in his introductory uh, talk talked a lot about this. They, they have um, bacteria symbionts which enable, which make up for the absence of essential amino acids. So there are 10 amino acids that, that uh, uh, can't be made uh, by the bug themselves. They need bacterial uh, partners to make them. Uh, in Akenarika, they most have two bacterial partners. There's some exceptions. And they make it possible to live on uh, xylem sap. And you can see these things. Uh, they're not as obvious in Polanus as they are in some other nymphs, but uh, there they are, those, those little reddish patches showing through the uh, abdomen in this uh, probably fifth, fifth in star nymph. If we can go on here. So uh, here you have uh, the, the two standard uh, spittle bug in the, in the symbionts, which is Solcia. Solcia is the ancient uh, symbiont that, that Yasek talked about that may or may not go all the way back to the Permian. Uh, and spittle bugs, the second symbiont, and most spittle bugs is in Daria. Interestingly, in the Philanini, uh, the lion tribe that uh, Philanus is part of, uh, there's been a replacement of that ancient Zendaria with uh, a, a species of bacteria near Sodalus. Uh, and while Sol Solcia and Zendaria are extremely reduced parasites, they have very incomplete genomes, uh, they, um, the uh, Sodalus is, is not nearly as reduced, and it brings a whole repertoire of uh, uh, genes potentially be made uh, some use of uh, by uh, the Flamei line. Um, and this is, this is really, in some ways, the most extraordinary part of the story. You say, well, xylem feeders are polyphages. 
Uh, it's been polyphagous a long time. Maybe all its ancestors were polyphagous, but the evidence suggests otherwise. There are eight species of Phalanus in the Mediterranean area. Five of them are narrow monophages. Four live on this lily here. It's a lily group called Asphodelus. Technically, they're not lilies, but they're closely related to lilies. And the, the nymphs of four Phalanus species are monophagous on these lilies. And then the adults in the summer go up on, on some other things. That's another story. Uh, and there's, if you look at the, the molecular phylogeny, which there is some of these eight species, and another one is a narrow uh, monophage on, a, on, a, on another species of, of plant. Uh, and then there's a sister species of Phalanus primarius, which, which is a, a, a broad polyphage. Uh, uh, it's extraordinary that in the last few million years, uh, this bug seems to have evolved from being a narrow monophage to being the world champion polyphage. And I, I, my gut tells me it might have something to do about the potential that lay in that sodalis genome. But the sodalis genome isn't the whole story because these things that are narrow monophages also have the sodalis genome. So it's, I think, but, but it may, may have been some unleashable evolutionary potential there. Uh, get back to, there, there are two special cases of spinobug hosts, which I wanted to bring up uh, here. Uh, one is nitrogen fixing plants that, that uh, fix atmospheric nitrogen in their roots. Uh, the other is ectomycorrhizal plants. They don't fix nitrogen, but they are specialized, these are fungi that specialize in, in um, exploiting and harvesting uh, organically bound nitrogen uh, from the soil that's otherwise unavailable to plants or not easily available to plants. In both cases, when the nitrogen comes into the plant, either through nitrogen fixation or through uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, it's converted into amino acids for transport in the xylem. Uh, it's brought into the plant as ammonium. Ammonium is toxic. First thing the plant does is turn it into amino acids. And that's what gives the xylem feeder something to eat, makes it possible to eat. And if you're nitrogen fixing or ectomycorrhizal, chances are you have more and more reliable uh, amino acids in your xylem stream. And that, that accounts for what you'll see here, which is a disproportionately high number of spittle bugs that feed on things that are either nitrogen fixers, likely nitrogen fixers, or ectomycorrhizal. Um, here you see that uh, uh, approximately 19% uh, of all spittle bugs, maybe about 500 for a tree known host, uh, feed on ectomycorrhizal plants as, as their primary uh, host. Uh, and another large proportion amounting for a little over about a third of uh, feed on plants that exhibit one form or another of uh, 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 nitrogen fixation, and so together those two categories account for about half of all, all spittle bugs. Uh, here's a good example of a spittle bug on a nitrogen fixing plant. This is why Weaver and King were working on their monograph back in 1954. In the first place at that time in North America, Eastern North America in particular, Flannus primarius was a major pest of Metacogga sativa, or alfalfa, or lizard, depending on where you come from. Um, Ectomycorrhizal plants are probably less familiar to y'all, but um, tell me how much time. Time's up. Okay, we're moving along quick. But I want to show you, here, here are a couple. This, these, are, these are young pine trees. We're going to go see some of us some pines tomorrow, and I'm eager to see if there's spittle bugs on them. But here's some spittle bugs on ectomycorrhizal pine trees. Um, that's Flanus primarius. Here's Flanus primarius in Corsica, part of France. Right, guys? Um, and uh, it's an ectomycorrhizal host. Uh, and uh, this is the paper in which you can read about all of this. And uh, we'll go through. So what does this mean for, for Xylella in Europe in particular? Doesn't mean anything good. You've got a spittle bug that feeds on almost anything, and it's feeding a plant pathogen that affects almost everything. There, there are, as you can see here, 690 uh, plant species uh, that Xylella fits on. This is a terrible mix. Where we have Phalanus primarius and Xylella together, it will be vectored, it will be moving around the environment. Uh, and uh, it's not a total disaster because Xylella doesn't damage all plants, only certain substrains or subspecies damage certain plants.
but it's a but it's a problem. Uh, there is some hope uh, here. You see uh, some uh, resistant olive trees. That's the path of the future for growing olives again in Italy, growing next to some dead olive trees. And are there any any? I got a little moment of levity here. Conferences get along. Are there are there things that eat more things than Plantus primarius? Cats. <laughs> while I was while I was working on this, I ran into this article in the New York Times, and there we got cats that eat two, over two thousand prey species. Prey were very uh, liberally interpreted, and included things like water buffalo, so there's some scavenging included in there. So uh, self promotion. These are the two main papers that uh, are concerned with this. I thank you all.